Hello, everyone, and welcome to the ARIMA webinar, Epigenetic Therapy Targets the 3D Epigenome in Endocrine-Resistant Breast Cancer. We'll get started in a minute. So today, we have two presentations. The first will be a short introduction to 3D genomics, which will set the stage for our guest speaker, Dr. Johanna ahinger Kozlowska, who will share about her lab's recent work in epigenetic therapy targets in endocrine-resistant breast cancer. All right, and with that, I'd like to introduce Kristen Sakin, Director of Research at ARIMA. She holds a PhD in biology and manages ARIMA's clinical and discovery research programs. Kristen, the floor is yours. All right, um, welcome everyone, and thank you uh, for joining us. I'm very excited to be here today to share some of our latest research from ARIMA Genomics. In my presentation today, I'll begin with an introduction to ARIMA's technology and the types of information that can be delivered by our core product. Next, we'll go into some examples of how this technology is applied to human health research at a high level. And finally, we'll take a deeper dive into how ARIMA's tech has been applied in cancer research. So let's go ahead and jump right in. It looked like many of you were new to the ARIMA community um, and maybe new to 3D genomics as well, so welcome. Uh, we are a 3D genomics company based in Southern California. And at ARIMA, we provide easy to use kits that integrate seamless, seamlessly with NGS pipelines, as well as end-to-end -end services on a wide range of sample types. That allows our customers to use our core ARIMA high c technology in order to address a variety of fundamental biological questions. So just to share some of the reasons why our customers really like working with ARIMA technology. First, we have really flexible sample and input requirements. Our data outputs are also compatible with standard NGS analysis pipelines. And finally, ARIMA takes a science first approach to working with our customers. So whether you wanna try 3D genomics in your own lab or want our help in preparing and sequencing samples, we can support you in either of those endeavors. Now, the types of questions that we can address with 3D genomics have applications in a lot of different areas of active research. Uh, 3D genomics allows us to describe the, the uh, spatial um, organization of chromosomes and has contributed greatly to genome assembly, including the recent publication <clears throat> of the first T to T human genome. 3D genomics has also had an enormous impact on epigenetics as it captures how spatial and temporal changes in chromatin conformation can alter gene regulation and cellular function. But the real promise of 3D genomics is that we can leverage these structural uh, and functional insights from the 3D genome and apply them to major challenges in human health with the goal of being able to understand the mechanisms underlying disease and ultimately of developing new therapeutic approaches. So let's first talk about what 3D genomics actually is, and then see how it can reveal these important biological insights. To understand the 3D genome, let's start with what we are all more familiar with, maybe, what we would call linear genomics, or the 1D genome. We can define linear genomics as the process of figuring out the order of each of the 3 billion A's, G's, C's, and T's of the genome in each of our different chromosomes. But of course, there's far more complexity to the genome than can be easily captured in this linear paradigm. What we know now is that DNA is not just randomly shoved into the nucleus of cells. There is a defined pattern to how chromosomes are packaged into compartments. And this is what 3D genomics allows us to describe. 3D genomics takes into account not only the sequence, but also the structure of how that DNA is organized in the nucleus to better understand gene regulation and genome function. So when we think about 3D genomics, we can see that the sequence is really just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to understanding genome function. Using a 3D genomics approach, you can understand not only the sequence, but also structural variants like translocations, indels, inversions. Going further, it helps us to understand the mechanisms of gene regulation and even broader genome organization like chromosomal compartments, by topologically associated domains or looping structures, all of which can affect genome function. While 3D genomics on its own can provide valuable insight into genome function, it perhaps has the greatest impact when used in conjunction with a broad multiomics approach. So in a standard multiomics worldview, 
we can see a distinct knowledge gap and that is still very challenging to link the blueprint of the genome sequence to the epigenomic modifications that can affect genome function via these downstream components. And 3D genomics, I would argue, fills that knowledge gap by providing valuable insight into how chromatin conformation regulates genes and alters the epigenetic landscape of a cell. As I hope you will see through this presentation and as Tordini and colleagues laid out in their review a few years ago, 3D genomics or the study of chromatin conformation is really an integrator of genomic and epigenetic information and sits in this incredibly important space between genotype and phenotype. It's these long range interactions that we can detect with 3D genomics that really help us understand genetic mutation, environmental regulation, gene expression, and how all of this connects through pathways and through the metabolome. Now, the general workflow of Arima's high C technology begins with sample prep using our kits. And Arima's kits work with a wide variety of sample types and input amounts, including cell lines, frozen tissue, even FFPE tissue that is common for profiling of tumors in cancer research. Then from a given sample, Arima's chemistry preserves that spatial organization of chromosomes within the nucleus by cross-linking and ligating the proximal pieces of DNA together prior to NGS library prep. Arima's user-friendly workflows are fully compatible with existing NGS library prep kits to easily prepare samples for Illumina short read sequencing and provide data outputs that can be analyzed using Arima's and other NGS analysis pipelines. So our customers really appreciate that this workflow plugs into this existing NGS ecosystem and the Illumina platform in particular, and we can provide a portable and scalable bioinformatics solution that is easy to install and run and provides robust and reliable results. So now I wanna give you a sense of how we visualize ARIMA's high c data. This is a heat map used by the Telomere to Telomere Consortium to scaffold the complete human genome sequence. And what you're seeing here is each of the chromosomes lined up across the top and the side. And each point on this heat map represents physical interactions between two regions of the genome. So the dark red points uh, that you see along the diagonal indicates that there are a lot of these 3D interactions between those regions. And the light red or white indicates minimal 3D interaction. So as you can see, it's very common for chromosomes to form 3D linkages within themselves, but at least in healthy cells, chromosomes will, fair, will rarely form these linkages with other chromosomes. So keep this in mind for later in the talk. Now in the next few minutes, I wanna show you some examples of the ways in which 3D genomics can facilitate discovery research. Current research uses 3D genomics to, for example, elucidate the link between 3D gene organization and gene expression across cell types, cell states, times, uh, all to understand genome organization and function. 3D genomics is also useful for exploring disease mechanisms, and people have used it to understand disease evolution, to identify genetic drivers of disease, to characterize disease microenvironments and subtypes, or to establish 3D genomic biomarkers. And finally, it has also been used to link risk variants to target genes and disease pathogenesis, improving interpretation of disease risk variants. So here I just wanna show that there are many examples of papers that have come out in recent years that have used 3D genomics in these three key ways. And I wanna highlight just a couple of these examples next. So our first example is this really exciting paper that was published in Nature Genetics in 2020 by Klokin and colleagues. And what they were able to demonstrate here was how the 3D organization of an oncogene relative to its enhancer could affect the progression of T-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Now, in this first set of diagrams representing a healthy patient, we can see that the oncogene, in this case, it's MYC, and this putative enhancer element are about two megabases away from each other in linear space. But 3D genomics shows us that these two elements normally arrange into two individual looping structures that are quite distinct from one another. However, in patients with this leukemia, we see new transcription factor binding activity at that enhancer, 
and a corresponding activation of the MYC gene to megabases away. Taking a 3D genomics approach, we can see that there's a rearrangement of the chromatin loops. This leads to the enhancer element here being brought into close proximity to the MYC gene, causing that aberrant expression at MYC. And the authors of this study went on to show that by inhibiting the transcription factor bound to this enhancer with pharmaceuticals, they could restore normal expression of MYC. So using 3D genomics, they were first able to identify the mechanisms by which MYC is misregulated in T-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And secondly, perhaps more importantly, inform exactly which transcription factor needed to be targeted by that treatment to restore normal function. Now, here's another example that came out just this year where the authors used 3D genomics as part of a multi-omics approach to understand the gene regulatory mechanisms in the human retina. Because by combining high-resolution Hi-C data with additional data describing histone marks, transcription factor binding sites, and super enhancer locations, they gained really valuable insights into the mechanisms of gene regulation in the retina. And this data was further integrated with GWAS and EQTL data to uncover some candidate genes and variants that were linked to age-related macular degeneration and glaucoma. Now, the final example I want to highlight here used a really interesting method to jointly profile chromatin conformation and DNA methylation in single nuclei. This study showed that the remodeling of DNA methylation is temporally separated from chromatin conformation dynamics, and that different tissues have varied chromatin conformations. Moreover, this work was able to reconstruct the regulatory programs of cell type differentiation and found that putatively causal common variants for schizophrenia strongly overlap cell type specific regulatory regions. Now, in the last few minutes today, I'd like to highlight how ARIMA technology has been used to identify novel structural variants in cancers. 3D genomics is a very powerful tool for cancer research, which provides several key points of information. Because it's an NGS-based methodology, we are able to obtain information about the fundamental DNA sequence in tumor samples. And I've also already shown you an example of how we can detect the 3D interactions that yield insights in gene regulation. Uh, for example, the leukemia example that I gave. And finally, I hope to convince you in the next few slides that 3D genomics is a very powerful method to identify structural variation, uh, such as gene fusions, which may be potential drivers for disease. So I wanna focus now on structural variants because they play a highly significant role in cancer biology. More than 95% of cancers have one or more somatic structural variants, and at least 30% of cancers have a known pathogenic variant that is used to diagnose or to stratify patients. Furthermore, structural variants are known to impact regulation of cancer genes through 3D interactions. So the detection of structural variation is essential for elucidating disease mechanisms, for diagnosis, and for aiding in patient stratification. And I hope to convince you today that a 3D genomics approach lends itself very well to the identification of structural variants and the characterization of gene regulation. However, it is obviously not the one and only approach that should be used. An integrated approach is really needed to characterize a, a structural variant's pathogenicity. For example, we might use 3D genomics in, in conjunction with RNA-seq to understand expression levels of genes in and around the structural variants, or RNA knockdowns or CRISPR to validate any potential targets that are revealed. So now let's look at the differences between a normal karyotype and an abnormal karyotype from a cancer cell line to see how we're able to detect structural variants from high c data. On the left here, I'm showing again a normal cell line, and we see again that the interactions uh, that we detect are primarily intrachromosomal. That is, they're interactions within the same chromosome and not typically between other uh, different chromosomes. By contrast, in the cancer cell line, we can see a very distinctive off-diagonal signal. So each one of these squares is highlighting a 3D linkage or a structural variant between chromosomes that is not present in the normal sample. 
These interchromosomal interactions are very characteristic of translocations. We can imagine here that genes A and B have been brought into close proximity because of a translocation. And what we're observing on this heat map then are the 3D linkages that span this breakpoint fusing the two chromosomes together. Finally, although we've highlighted translocation specifically here, I want to point out that other classes of structural variation can also be identified from their, from their signatures in high c data as well. So how does ARIMA's technology for detecting structural variation in tumors compare to the current gold standard methods? What I'm showing here is a cohort of samples that we received from a collaborator at Scripps MD Anderson representing FFPE preserved tissue from a variety of tumor and tissue types. These samples have been characterized using at least one of several different methods, some with FISH, some with targeted RNA sequencing, and some with targeted DNA sequencing. And they had been found to harbor the gene fusions that you see listed here. When we use Arima's high c technology to look for structural variation in these samples, we see that not only are we able to recapitulate the results that were found by the orthogonal methods, but we are in many cases able to identify the gene fusion partners that were previously unknown. Furthermore, we have also shown that we can achieve these results in FFPE tissues with archival periods up to 10 to 12 years. Here we were working with Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, to identify gene fusions in a set of alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma tumors with FOX01 gene fusions that were identified via FISH or via karyotyping. And once again, Arima's technology is able to recapitulate the results of the orthogonal assay method and provide additional information about the gene partner in the fusion that wasn't available from the other assays. The final example I want to show today comes from a collaboration we have with Dr. Matija Snuderl at NYU Langone. This was a pediatric patient with a stage two glioma that was initially treated with a subtotal resection of the tumor. Six months after her surgery, this patient experienced very rapid progression and the, the tumor returned quite aggressively. NYU performed comprehensive DNA and RNA sequencing of the primary tumor, which was inconclusive and no driver mutations could be identified. So we performed high C analysis using Arima's high C technology, and this revealed a novel structural variant on chromosome 9 right near the PDL1 gene. And PDL1 encodes a protein that helps immune cells recognize normal, healthy cells in the body. But in some cancers, high expression of PDL1 prevents immune cells from recognizing and targeting those cancer cells, allowing the tumor cells to proliferate. Since the high C data we had implicated a possible role for PDL1 in this patient, our collaborators at NYU decided to look further into that result. And in fact, for this patient, the ARIMA high C result was confirmed with immunohistochemical staining, which showed strong and diffuse PDL1 expression in the tumor cells. So, with the PDL1 expression confirmed, the patient was then started on immunotherapy with the drug pembrolizumab. And since this change in treatment, the patient has responded very well and her disease is now stable. So, what's particularly exciting about this case to me is that by using 3D genomics, we were able to identify a novel structural variant that was missed by other genomic tests and which provided the key functional insights that enabled the medical team to prescribe the best treatment for that patient. What we're seeing over and over again with these studies is that 3D genomics can really help cancer research in three key areas. First, 3D genomics can help us detect known fusions, such as those involving NTREC, ROS, or other key cancer genes, as well as novel gene fusions. 3D genomics allows us to find key gene fusions and structural variants that are missed by other technologies, just as we saw in the PDL1 glioblastoma patient. And finally, 3D genomics has really helped to unlock access to fusion from archived FFPE uh, specimens which typically provide few answers in molecular assays, especially for these older, sample, uh, these older specimens. And we have demonstrated concordance with FISH and other methods, even in 10-year-old or older archival samples. 
So in conclusion, I hope I've helped convince you that there is much more to the genome than just sequence, and that by using a 3D genomics approach, we can help provide novel insights for disease researchers. I hope I've also convinced you that ARIMA's high c technology is a robust and reliable solution that is currently being implemented across a wide range of basic and translational research areas. So with that, thank you all for your attention, and I will turn it back over to Logan to introduce our next speaker. Thank you. Okay, great. That was a wonderful presentation, Kristen. Thank you. Uh, now I'd like to introduce Joanna ahinger Kowatska. Joanna is a group leader at the 3D Epigenome Center Group at the Garvin Institute of Medical Research, and she completed her PhD at the Uni University of Tübingen in Germany. The primary objective of her research team is to gain insight into the role of 3D genome organization in the development of treatment-resistant breast and prostate cancer. Her group aims to identify new therapeutic targets and biomarkers to improve the treatment of metastatic disease. Joanna, the floor is yours. Great. Um, so first, I'd like to thank Arima for the um, opportunity to present my group's work. Um, so I'll be talking about our more recent work uh, where we used epigenetic therapy to target the 3D epigenome in endocrine-resistant breast cancer. Um, so first, um, uh, around 70% of all breast cancer patients are estrogen receptor positive or ER positive, and um, they will receive some kind of endocrine treatment uh, which blocks the ER signaling on which their tumors depend for growth. Um, an endocrine treatment has been very um, successful and very significantly reduces the patient's risk of relapse. However, there's still around 25% um, of patients um, who, yes, 25% of patients um, that are treated with endocrine therapy but will eventually relapse. And that is due to the development of endocrine resistance in their tumors. And our um, lab and now my group has a long-standing interest in the role of um, specifically epigenetic changes um, in the development of endocrine resistance. So um, our first work in that field, it's been almost 10 years ago now, has shown that um, endocrine resistance associated with huge changes in DNA methylation, and that's mostly um, DNA hypermethylation, and when we looked um, precisely where this hypermethylation was occurring in endocrine resistant cells, um, as you can see on this example here, when we compare green bars being um, endocrine sensitive MCF7 cells to um, red and orange endocrine resistant MCF7 cells, we can see this huge gain in DNA methylation at um, enhancer regions, and that enhancer specific DNA hypermethylation was um, significantly enriched uh, for ER binding that was then um, consequently lost in the resistant cells. So considering these um, changes were occurring at um, distal regulatory elements, uh, when I joined the lab, I decided to look at the impact of these changes on the 3D genome structure. Kirsten already mentioned um, the DNA inside the cell nucleus is organized in a very tightly regulated manner. And um, there are three main levels of this organization that we tend to look at. So um, the first level, we have large chromosomal compartments, which we call A and B compartments. When we zoom in to around one megabase regions, uh, we can see then um, topological associated domains. And finally, at the level of single genes, we can see um, individual chromatin interactions or chromatin loops. So chromosome compartments are A and B compartments. And um, so basically A compartments being um, open chromatin compartments that are usually in the middle of the nucleus. And um, they would be um, gene rich. They are associated with high levels of transcription and open chromatin. While well, on the other hand, um, we can identify B compartments and these are on the nuclear periphery. Um, they are frequently gene poor, and they're associated with gene silencing and close chromatin. 
Um, so next level of organization is a division of um, segregation of chromatin into topological domains. So these are the triangles you can see usually in the high C map. Um, they are around one megabase in size, depending how you identify them. But they're basically defined by um, boundaries which separate two different regions that um, don't interact with other, but interact a lot within them. So um, we know that TAT boundaries are maintained by architectural proteins like CTCF and cohesin. Uh, the boundaries are highly conserved and shared across cell types. Uh, however, the exact role uh, of TATs in controlling gene expression is still up for debate and there's a lot of um, work on it. Um, so finally, at the level of single genes, um, the DNA is organized into chromatin interactions. So these are um, chromatin loops that uh, bring together uh, gene promoters to the um, distal regulatory elements, for example, enhancers, and that facilitates correct gene expression patterns. And these interactions um, are also maintained by the work of um, transcription factors and architecture proteins like um, CTCF. Um, so Christine has already introduced the high C technique, but this is um, the technique that we used in the lab um, to study 3D genome. So quickly, um, the DNA inside the cell is cross-linked um, to preserve the 3D structure, uh, followed by digestion with restriction, multiple restriction enzymes. Then we tack the biotin um, on the ends, ligate it back together, and um, the, the ends, and then um, prepare it as a library for sequencing by pulling it down with um, streptavidine beads. So then um, we sequence it, and finally we can map the, the uh, map the interacting regions back to the reference genome. And it usually looks as heat maps, or we like to plot them as arcs, where we can then identify which promoter um, is interacting with each enhancer on the reference genome. So using this technique, we um, studied um, how the 3D genome changes in endocrine resistant cells. So again, we used here um, MCF7 cells, which are um, endocrine treatment sensitive, and compared them to the um, endocrine resistant um, derivatives, so these two cell lines, um, uh, fulvestrant resistant and amoxifen resistant. And here is just a very short example of how uh, what we found in that work is um, so we found that but there was a large number of um, interactions that changed in the resistant cells. And the frequent pattern that we found to be most associated with resistance is where we see a disruption in um, um, when we see a loss of interactions um, that were present in MCF7 cells, and then um, they were then lost in the resistant cells, and this loss. Um, occurred at regions when we can see an increase in DNA methylation at the anchors when we zoom in. And this increase in DNA methylation was also present in um, patient tumors, as uh, metastatic tumors as compared to their primaries. And uh, when we further looked at the exact anchor locations, we found they were frequently um, located at ER binding sites again and enhancers. So suggesting that that ER um, bound chromatin interactions are lost in endocrine resistance due to um, DNA hypermethylation of these regions. So based on this um, discovery, our next hypothesis was that maybe we can use some kind of epigenetic drugs that will cause DNA demethylation um, to reverse these 3D epigenome changes associated with endocrine resistance. So to test this, um, we moved on to PDX models. So patient-derived xenograph models. So it's had two breast cancer metastasis models that have been um, run in mice. And we treated those uh, mice with either no treatment or GECO uh, for these two PDX models or epigenetic therapy with the cytobine at the very low um, dose. So um, low dose, the cytobine, um, you said DNA metallins cancer metal transferase inhibitor. It has been already um, FDA approved for some for treatment in leukemia. There's lots of clinical trials um, currently ongoing um, in mostly in US. So 
So first, um, in both PDX models, the cytokine treatment resulted in um, very significant suppression of tumor growth. So the, um, the cells continued to grow, but they just were proliferating at a much slower rate, which we then confirmed by KI67 staining. Um, so to understand the molecular mechanism of the uh, response to the cytokine treatment or the um, molecular changes that are associated with this um, suppression of tumor growth, we next uh, performed multi-omics profiling. So we um, used, um, we studied DNA methylation first with EPIC and then with whole genome bisulfide sequencing. We looked at gene expression changes with RNA-seq. Um, we did some chip seq for transcription factors. And finally, we used a genome-wide high c as well as a promoter capture high c um, to look at um, enhanced promoter interactions. Um, so we first look at the effects of the cytobine on DNA methylation levels in these tumors. And as expected for cells that are continuously treated with the cytobine, we observed um, huge genome-wide loss of DNA methylation. Um, so we wanted to know if this loss is um, occurring at specific regions in the genome, and we know that it's easier to, it's very hard to demethylate promoters. So we found that um, DNA hypermethylations was mostly enriched at enhancers, so putative enhancer or regulatory elements. And um, when we looked specifically at these enhancers, we found um, actually around 40% loss of methylation at enhancer regions. Um, so next, we um, use our high C data to look at the larger um, chromatin structure changes, like the large scale ones. So um, we observed overall decompaction of the 3D genome. So um, when we quantified it, we found um, majority of compartment changes were occurring from B closed compartments to A open compartments. And this is quite, uh, quantified on the pie chart with 60, more than 60% changing from B to A. And when we looked at the DNA methylation at this um, compartments that switch from B to A, we can see that these compartments actually lose DNA methylation. Um, so then we looked at um, what's happening at the topological domains um, structures. And when we looked at the insulation, which is the breaks in between the um, triangles, so how insulated is one triangle or one domain from another one, we found um, that the cytobin tumors have a loss of insulation. And that was um, associated with a uh, um, huge loss of number of domain boundaries that can be called from the high C data. So to visualize what uh, we found is here is an example of one of such domains. When you can see the um, vehicle samples have a um, tut domain here, and this is the nut called in the cytobin tumors, and that is associated with loss of insulation here. So the algorithm is not calling it as a domain anymore. Um, so from this, our next step was to um, study um, specifically enhanced promoter interactions. So for this, we used um, Arima Capture HiC, which is a, um, a enrichment system that's targeted to all human gene promoters. That's around 23,000 gene promoters. And um, this enrichment allows us to downsample the, or no, to study the interactions from the genome-wide HiC at a much higher resolution with not um, billions of reads required. So our um, on-target rate was around 70, 90%. Um, and here's an example of how and uh, how this enrichment works. So the um, top one is a genome-wide high C at that uh, specific locus at 10 KB resolution. And then uh, we can uh, subset the reads for the genome-wide high C specifically from this promoter, but we still can only do it at 10 KB resolution, which means that we still don't really know which enhancers are the key ones interacting here. And um, this is an example of how our promoter capture data looks when you can see all those um, interactions coming out of the bait, and we can very um, well pinpoint which actual potential enhancers, so we call them other ends, um, are interacting with that promoter at a, and that's a 1.5 PV resolution. Um, so first we looked at um, how the interactions are changing um, following the cytobine treatment. So to do this, we counted 
how many for each promoter that's baited, how many other end interactions we can detect in gecko on the bottom and the cytobin treated tumors on the left axis. So with the shift in the red axis, you can see that um, each promoter is actually interacting with more than more enhancers in cytobin treated tumors than in the gecko. And we used um, differential analysis with cheek diff to um, quantify this. And we found that for well, majority of promoter baits were unchanged. We see this huge gain in number of other ends or number of enhancers being connected to this um, promoters in promoter interacting regions. Um, so then we looked at um, what's happening to the genes um, located at this gained differential interactions. And we see that um, majority uh, of this um, gain interactions are associated with increased gene expression with around 500 genes being um, differentially expressed um, and upregulated. And when we looked at what kind of genes um, are those, so we did gene, assess, um, gene um, GSAE analysis, and we found that um, these genes were enriched for all the common pathways um, associated with um, tumor inhibition, like um, cell cycle and so on. But we also found um, that they were associated with um, estrogen response, which was interesting. And that estrogen response was actually activated with the cytokine treatment. Um, so we next looked at um, transcription factors that are involved in this gained um, chromatin interactions. And we found that this differentially interacting anchors or the other ends were enriched for um, um, a few transcription factors that are known to be involved in interactions like CDCF and some zinc fingers. But we also found that um, enrichment for ERE motifs, so that's an estrogen receptor um, DNA binding motif. So to look at this further, we performed um, ER um, chip seek um, in the decitabine and vehicle tumors. And we found that um, ER binding was significantly reprogrammed with the cyto in the site of treated tumors. And majority of these differential ER, ER binding sites were actually gained on, in the site of tumors. Um, so when we specifically then looked at the association between those altered ER binding sites and gained enhancer interactions, we found that these interactions were significantly enriched for gained ER sites um, as shown in the bar plot here, as well as um, you can see this change in the signal intensity. And finally, when we um, looked at specifically at this ER bound gained matting interactions, uh, we found um, that majority of genes that were connected to those interactions um, gained expression with lots of um, estrogen response genes um, shown here being detected. So to um, highlight, um, here is, to, or to summarize, um, here is an example of one of those genes. So this is a SPATA18 gene, uh, where in, in uh, vehicle tumors, there is um, no ER binding at this enhancer region. And then um, following the cytobine treatment, we see a gain in ER binding. We see loss of um, DNA methylation, specifically at this enhancer. And that's associated with an uh, increase in um, interacting interactions uh, for, with the SPATA18 promoter. And um, that um, was associated with an uh, increase in um, expression of the gene. And this gene is actually known to be associated, its high expression is known associated with better outcome in patients. So from this, we are wondering, um, what are the actual dynamics between the DNA methylation change and the 3D epigenome remodeling? So to study this, we used um, we turned to a cell line model of tamoxifen resistant MCF7 cells we have used previously, so Tamar cells, and we designed a time course experiment of the site of treatment. So in this experiment, we took Tamar cells and we treated them with the site of being low dose, no cytotoxic again, for seven days, um, and then we collected cells, and for the rest of the cells, we um, let them recover. Um, for 28 days and collected cells again. And for the cells, we uh, performed um, epic DNA methylation. We looked at promoter capture high C as well as RNA seq. So, first, um, we saw that um, the site of treatment in um, Tamar cells was associated with a very significant loss of methylation, even more pronounced than in the uh, PDX models. 
while um, and this methylation was partially recovered after 20 days of um, no decidedin treatment, um, as shown on the bar plots here. So again, we um, looked at um, the enhanced promoter interactions and um, how they compare between the controls and the um, and the decidedin treatment. So um, day seven decidedin, again, we saw this um, increase in the number of enhancers being connected to their gene promoters um, following decidedin. And interestingly, when we looked at this at the recovery time point, most of those interactions um, have recovered or they were lost again after 28 days, suggesting that the DNA methylation is partially returning to the sites and closing those, um, those regions and uh, preventing the interactions. Um, so we looked at the gene expression and how that changes with um, at this um, gained um, enhanced promoter interactions. And we found that gained enhanced promoter interactions at day seven site of treatment was associated with a um, huge increase in gene expression. And we could see some of the genes that we also observed in PDXs, uh, which are highlighted on the volcano plot here. Uh, well, at the following 28 days of um, DNA remethylation, we found that majority of those genes um, were silenced again, while some genes um, remained either overexpressed or actually continued in um, high expression. So um, to summarize this, um, here is a very big figure of all the data sets um, put together. So um, at the top, we see um, an enhancer region at the same spot 18 gene lock as I showed you before, where we can see again in your binding in the PDXs as well as uh, between the MCF7 sensitive and Tomar cells. Um, at this, um, then we see a loss of DNA methylation in the cytobin treatment in the axis, as well as at day seven cytobin treatment. And that methylation is largely recovered or remethylated at day seven, day 28. And when we look at chromatin interactions, we see again in enhanced chromatin interactions of the cytobin in the axis. We also, and that's also in the day seven, um, the cytobin treatment of the cell lines. And then um, these interactions are then lost or recovered uh, when we see the remethylation at the 28 recovery. And this gene um, increases in expression at day seven with the cytobin treatment. And then um, that um, expression is, um, goes back down to the vehicle control levels. Um, so in conclusion, um, our research has shown that the cytobin-induced genome-wide DNA hypermethylation results in large-scale 3D genome or 3D epigenome depletion. And that includes decompaction of higher order chromatin structure and loss of um, topological associated domains. We see um, significant DNA hypermethylation at ER enhancer elements, which is then associated with gain in ER binding at these enhancers, um, ectopic um, enhancer promoter interactions, and then we see activation of this ER mediated transcriptional pathways and programs. And uh, finally, we found that long term withdrawal of epigenetic therapy can partially restore methylation at this ER enhancer element, um, and that results in loss of ectopic enhancer promoter, uh, promoter interactions and um, associated gene repression. So, um, Finally, we think that this work shows um, a potential for epigenetic therapy to be used in endocrine resistant breast cancer. And we suggest that this um, works by um, DNA methylation dependent rewiring of the 3D chromatin interactions that's associated with suppression of tumor growth. And we have um, updated our uh, preprint on this work, um, and you can find it on bioarchives. Um, so um, finally, I'd like to thank um, my lab. So this is Susan Clark's lab at the Garvan Institute, uh, my 3D epigenome cancer group, which currently um, consists of two PhD students, Elisa, who's done a lot of these experiments for this work, and Anthony, as well as our collaborators in Australia and at Arima. Thank you for your attention. Okay, great. And with that, uh, we will open up to our Q&A portion. Uh, just as a reminder, 
you can submit questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. All right. And with that, we have a couple questions already in. Uh, the first one is for Kristen. Um, can you detect fusions even if you're looking at tissues with pre-neoplastic foci that would be diluted by the normal tissue? And is this approach useful to understand chemical effects on the genome, especially on gene predicting gene expression patterns? Yeah, so I don't have a lot of familiarity with pre-neoplastic foci specifically, but this question seems like it's really asking, like, what are our limits of detection for a given tumor percentage in a sample? Um, and I can say we're still kind of working on figuring out the exact limits of that detection giving, given low percent tumor in, in samples. It's still something that, that we're actively working on. But we have done some uh, in silico experiments um, mixing, uh, mixing sequencing reads from, <clears throat> from normal samples and cancer samples. And we're able to detect those gene fusions from the, from the cancer sample, even when those reads from the tumor cells are representing as low as like 1% of uh, our uh, like total sequencing reads in a sample. So I, th I think our limits of detecting that are probably pretty low. And I don't know, we'd have to like maybe talk about what the exact uh, scenario is in your case, but um, it, it's possible we could could detect those. Um, I think the second part of your question is whether that would be useful for understanding chemical effects on the genome and uh, predicting gene expression patterns. Um, I think a high c approach could be very useful um, <clears throat> for understanding certain types of effects uh, from chemicals on the genome. I think that's what you're asking about. Um, it, I, I think it could give a lot of insight into things like gene and promoter interactions um, and kind of give you a sense of how gene regulation might change in response to different, uh, different environmental or chemical uh, stimuli. I think that would be a very powerful approach if you're using it, especially in a multi-omics uh, framework kind of in concert with RNA-seq or something that gives you that gene expression data more directly as well. Um, but yeah, depending on what, what exactly your question is, we could certainly talk with you more about what, what you're interested in and how we can get you, uh, answers to some of those questions. Great, Kristen. Thank you for that. Um, the next question we have in, uh, have you checked methylation or transcription of repeat sequences considering mechanisms of death to bind and cancer demonstrated by others? Yeah, um, so that's a good question. Um, so we specifically wanted to study the effects of the cytobin on the tumor because we, um, in order to look at the epigenome, genome, we actually need the tumor to still be there and not be removed by immune cells. So our mice are immune um, incompetent, so they basically have no immune system. But even in our immune com um, incompetent mice, we do see uh, we see loss of methylation, so we looked at, um, it's a, there's a special package which has a, um, a, a reference for the different transposable elements and repeat sequences, and we see loss of methylation there. And we also um, analyzed our RNA-seq data to um, look at TE transcripts specifically, and we see activation of them. We also, which I haven't shown, we also see um, huge activation in um, gene enrichment patterns or um, that are related to immune responses. So um, to study, I mean, so just a response in cells that don't even have an immune system to actually activate. Um, so to better study it, we need in immune competent mice, which are, it's not easy to grow PDX samples in immune competent mice. And obviously this will be a key mechanism in patients. Um, so this is something we are now looking at, at how the cytobine treatment will change the immune cells and maybe activate immune cells to then target the tumor. Uh, we're also looking at tumor microenvironment and how the immune cell penetration will go into the tumor. So it's a separate mechanism kind of that we are moving now to look at. Thanks, Joanna. Uh, 
Um, our next question is, can this technique be used for Buffico DNA? Yes, um, we've definitely used it for that before. It works really well. Yeah, so we can definitely do that. Great. Um, could you please provide help pro providing the name of this tool slash software that you use to identify the A and B compartments? Um, so for this work, I believe we used um, Homer, which is the old, very old tool that works on, it has its own high C data analysis, and then you basically decode PC1 values on those regions. Um, to plot the um, A and B compartments, we also looked at A and B interactions between the compartments, and that we did with Genova, which is a newer tool, which is really great. And there's actually more tools being developed on a daily basis, and we are testing some of them, and some of them look better, some of them look worse. Um, so we're kind of testing and seeing um, if the data looks reasonable. We check if it um, correctly overlaps with gene transcription. We check if it overlaps with methylation. Frequently, we have replication timing data, which we know that very um, um, reasonable, um, there's a reasonable correlation between um, compartment scores and replication timing. So we also validate with that. Um, but yeah, there's lots of tools, um, better or worse. Thanks, Joanna. And then our next question, have you checked what happened to other off-target regions upon epigenome editing, like demethylation of a methylated region, like impact on a tag boundaries? Um, yeah, so um, the DNA demethylation is happening very genome-wide. And we know that from recent, very recent studies that just losing DNA methylation does not really change the um, transcriptome or the genome that much. Um, so we think that off-target effects are less important than the effects on transcription factor binding when we actually see changes. Um, however, we have been asked a lot about um, TAD boundaries specifically because we know that there's a subset of CTCF sites that are methylation dependent. Um, and even though I, it's just thousands of, so it's a 1% of all CTCF sites that are methylation dependent, in principle, if you demethylate them, we should see a change in TAD boundaries. So we actually now um, doing those experiments um, to map the CTCF, and then we'll look at the relation to TAD boundaries specifically for that. Thanks, Joanna. And then what is the minimum amount of buffy coat DNA needed if using this technique? Yes, so what, what we generally try to do is have uh, enough cells that will give us about a microgram, one to two micrograms of DNA at the end of our high C prep. Um, we can definitely go lower than that, like 50 nanograms or less, uh, even for some, some lower input things. But yeah, um, we can maybe, <laughs> maybe connect more directly and talk about what the requirements would be for that. Thanks, Christian. Um, during or after dectabine treatment of MCF7 resistant cells, do the cells start to revert back to being sensitive to estrogen? for proliferation or survival? Joanna? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, we haven't, so we have, when we did the time course experiments, we quite preserved the cells as viables to test that. We haven't, so this was an experiment that was done in between COVID lockdown and um, yeah, some other leave that I had to take, which was, yeah. <laughs> So we haven't done it yet, but I'd love to know the change in response. We also have the PDXs, which we also preserved at the end. So we're hoping we can put them back in the mouse and see if the, um, the tumors yeah, retain any of that endocrine sensitivity. Yeah. So we we're still testing that. And, you know, Hopefully it's the next paper rather than this one, but might still go into this one. It has to. <laughs> Thank you, Joanna. Um, we have a few more questions left. Um, if we don't reach all of your questions, somebody from our team at Arima will reach out to you. Um, 
but we can keep going. So our next question is how increased SPATA 18 is related to tumor inhibition? Uh, yes, um, so this is a missing part in our, because we have um, genomics lab, so don't know much about cell biology. So we actually, we, we identified a few genes that we think are key um, to the tumor inhibition. However, to actually link any of those genes directly to tumor inhibition, um, we haven't been able to. So we, we are planning some cell biology experiments, like looking at, yeah, knocking down any genes and seeing if they have an effect. Not sure they will have on their own or whether it's a, a pathway of genes that are being affected. Yeah, but these are not the experiments that yeah I know much about really. So, yes, I'd love to know that. Thanks, Joanna. Uh, so now we're at the top of the hour. Thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, so if we didn't reach your question, somebody from our team will reach out to you and. Thank you for joining us today.